When King Jabin of Hazar heard of this, he sent to King Joab of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Afshak, and to the king who were kings who were in the north hill country, and in the Arbath south of Chinrod, and in the lowland, and in Nathorder on the west, the Canaanites in the east and the west, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites under Aaron in the land of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops, a great army in number like the sand on the seashore, with very many horses and chariots. All these kings joined their forces and came and camped together at the waters of Naram to fight with Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid for them, for tomorrow of them, for tomorrow at this time I will hand over all of them, slain to Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua became came suddenly upon them with all his fighting force by the waters of Merom and fell upon them. And the Lord handed them over to Israel, who attacked them and chased them as far as the great Sidon and Mizrahophni, and eastward as far as the valley of Mizrah. They struck them down until they had no one left remaining. And Joshua did to them as the Lord commanded him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazor and struck its king down with the sword. Before that time, Hazor was the head of all those kingdoms, and they put to the sword all who were in it, utterly destroying them. There was no one left who breathed, and he burned Hazor with fire. And all the towns of those kings and all their kings Joshua took and struck them with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded. But Israel burned none of the towns that stood on the mounds except Hazor, which Joshua did burn. All the spoils of these towns and the livestock the Israelites took for their booty, but all the people they struck down with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they did not leave any who breathed. As the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. The second reading is from Matthew. I don't have my bulletin. I think it's Matthew 8. 5 through 13. 5 through 13. Thank you. <laughs> when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible stress. And he said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion, the centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only speak the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's funny for a <laughs> And to the centurions, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. Through these words, our God is still speaking. Thanks. I see you are still speaking, God. Give her a hand. She did very well. <laughs> yeah, Steve owes you big time. I only did it because I saw you could reach. Sure, when he does mine, make sure to hit the bit. <laughs> I'll make it with at least 30 or 40 names. I'll chew that verse that has the big off for the big ass for the big ass. Well, it's past Thursday. November 11, 2021, was celebrated as Veterans Day throughout our country. Some places had parades, others didn't. Some just gave speeches and that. According to the VA documentation, World War I was known as the Great War. The British ended with the Treaty of Versailles, signed on June 28, 1919, in a palace Versailles outside the city of Versailles, France. However, fighting had ceased seven months earlier. The armistice or temporary secession hostilities began or between the Allied nations and Germany were affected the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. 
For that reason, November 11, 1918, the jury regarded as the end of the war and all the wars. November 1919, President Wilson claimed November 11 as a first commemoration of Armistice Day with the following words. To us in America, the reflection of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride and the heroism of those who died in our country's service. The gratitude for the victory, both because of the things from which it has, it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given us in America to show her sympathy with peace and justice in the Council of Nations. The original concept of the celebration was for a day observed with parades and public meetings and a brief suspension of business beginning at 11 o'clock. I remember in school, how many of you in school remember November 11th? Everything stopped at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Act 52, Statute 351, Title 5, United States Code, Section 87A, approved on May 13, 1938, made the 11th of November in each year a legal holiday. They be ded dedicated to the cause of world peace, and be therefore celebrated and known as Armistice Day. So, Armistice Day was primarily set aside to honor World War I veterans. In 1954, after the World War II had required the greatest mobilization of soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen in the nation's history, after American forces had fought aggression in Korea, the 83rd Congress, at the urging of all veteran service organizations, amended the Act of 1938 by striking out the word armistice and inserting its place the word veterans. With the approval of this legislature, on June 1st, 1954, November 11th became a day to honor American veterans of all wars. It was an attempt in 1968 to move Veterans Day to a Monday, so that way it was a long holiday for <laughs> government workers. Yeah. That way, Washington's birthday, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, Columbus Day, we all celebrate on Monday. Well, you know how that went, don't you? <laughs> they thought it encouraged travel, recreational, and cultural activities and stimulate greater industrial and commercial production. Many states disregarded this and continued to celebrate November 11th on November 11th. First Veterans Day, under a new law, was observed with much confusion on October the 25th, 1971. When it was found that it was quite apparent that the commemoration of this day was a matter of historic and patriotic significance. A vast number of our citizens complained. And so on September the 20th, 1975, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, returned the annual observance of Veterans Day to its original date, November 11th, being 1978. And that was to support the desire of overwhelming majority of state legislatures, all major veteran service organizations, and the American people. So Veterans Day continues to be observed on November 11th, regardless of what day of the week it falls on. For the, reason, the uh, restoration of observance of Veterans Day on November 11th not only pervert, preserves the historical significance of the day, but also helps focus attention on the important purpose of Veterans Day. A celebration to honor America's veterans, their patriotism, love of country, and willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. I remember the day in April 1968 when I caught a Greyhound bus out of Troy, Ohio, and headed for Cincinnati to take my oath to play enlistment in the United States Army. I went down on a reported, reported report on April 15th, I took my oath on April 16th, 1968. That began my journey to becoming a veteran of the Vietnam conflict and my military active service ended on March 11th, 1972. My active, inactive reserve status ended on April 16th, 1974. Got a little document all you veterans have and know of called a DD-214. You all got your little certificate it's your graduation certificate. And that goes with you the rest of your life. Anything else that happens is added to that. But you know, the, the day we left the civilian world, and what we knew of life to that point, we all raised our right hand and took you into office, changed our lives forever. 
they'll never be the same. Their law requires everyone who lists or relists in our message armed forces to take a list of those. Dog or methyl thing, don't you? The other enlistment is administered by a commissioned officer to any person enlisting or re-enlisting for a term of service in any branch of the military. It's pretty straightforward. The oath is traditionally performed in front of the United States flag, other flags such as the state flag, the military branch flag, or a unit guide off. The slightly different oath is given to those in the National Guard. But the officer reads the oath, the person begin, being sworn in repeats it. And you all can remember back those days. I, in your name, you saw me swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulations and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. You all remember that? Yes, sir. <laughs> this oath now established from this day forward that we have placed our honor the forefront of our lives. This honor is something that we should still be living by today. It reflects not only our personal behavior, but on the nation that we said we would support, and the country that we love. So it shouldn't just be thrown aside because we are no longer in uniform in our country's military. We are living representations and representatives of millions of veterans who have gone before us and lived lives of faith and respect for their country, and their name. We now set the example of those who have already passed on to eternal life. The last four words of that oath that we took are the most important today as they were back then. And those last four words are, so help me God. So may God, in this, in our passage from Joshua, we read about the battle of Hazor. Kings of the north joined together to battle the Israelites, who controlled the southern half of Canaan. They gathered by the waters of Moron. But Joshua attacked them by surprise, and the, the enemy's chariots were useless in the dense forest. Hazar, the largest Canaanite center in Galilee, was destroyed. And Joshua carefully obeyed all the instructions given by God. This same obedience is repeated frequently in the book of Joshua. Partly because obedience is one of the aspects of life the individual believer can control. We can't control our understanding because we may not have all the facts. We can't control what other people do or how they treat us. However, we can control our choice to obey God. Whatever new challenges we may face, the Bible contains relevant instructions that we can choose to ignore or choose to follow. This touches on our New Testament lesson, which is very relevant. The issue boils down to trust. Joshua believed and trusted in God's leadership. <clears throat> trust is a complicated issue for all of us. And our trust issue extends even to God. We're forced to make a decision either to depend on God and trust or to go our own way. How many times do you go our own way sometimes in life? We even are told that Go your own way and make sure to lead them. Lift up our renegades, and our outliers, our enveloper pushers. Those who listen to no one but themselves and are suddenly our heroes. Their trust is strictly in themselves. They feel that they are God and that the world is only there for them to abuse and use. They care nothing about those around them, but what they can get out of them. And they cast them aside. It would be a very lonely road. But those who have held positions of power in companies, in the military, in politics, and in life know that the wisest of leaders have around them a circle of advisors whom they trust implicitly to check them in areas in which they are unfamiliar or weak. A leader is made by a group of people not by self-designation. The best leaders are those who know how to follow and to trust. Built represented in Jesus' time by the centurion is an organization in which follower, uh, followership, not leadership, is most important. 
See, following directions, following orders, suggestions is of utmost importance, not only for success, but for survival. One must put one's trust in the person in charge over your truth. Knowing that that person has your best interest and survival in mind at all times. The most medals are valid or won when one is of service to another, not themselves. To become a respected leader, one must know how to follow. Our greatest problem as followers of Jesus is not the lack of leadership skills or cultural relevance, but willful ignorance. Smug status quo, lack of trust, diminished dreams. See, Joshua and the centurion were trusted and respected, well respected, as leaders and followers with a strong faith in God's guidance. In Joshua's situation, the conquest of much of the land of Cana seems to have happened quickly, but it actually took seven years. We often expect quick changes in our lives and quick victories over sin. Our journey with God is a lifelong process. And the changes and victories may take time. But it's easy to grow impatient with God and feel like giving up hope because things are moving too slowly. When we are close to a situation, it's difficult sometimes to see progress. When we look back, you see that God never stopped working. A good soldier learns to be patient, to take their time, and be deliberate in their actions. Following orders is given, and not freelance. In the 21st through the 23rd verse, we heard how Joshua's trust and faith in, in being obedient to God paid off. When it came to the, the giant Aconites, Joshua's army didn't let their fear of them prevent them from engaging in battle and claim the land that God had promised. You know, in ancient times, soldiers went to battle were clad in heavy armor to protect them against the spears and arrows of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul urges his fellow Christians to take upon themselves the whole armor of God. Be equipped, he says, with a breastplate of righteousness the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. Stand, he says. Stand up against evil. We stand in the evil day, he says, and quench the flaming darts of the evil. The only he prescribes is for standing, not for running away. It's not for defense only, but also for conquest. Paul's picture is of a solitary soldier. The soldiers who do not fight alone. Neither do we who are Christian soldiers. In the old Macedonian Felix, the soldiers were positioned sold, uh, shoulder to shoulder, marching close, shields <coughs> overlapping, spears held forward as, as striking them. We who are involved in a conflict with evil in our time ought to stand and march as members together in an invincible show of faith. May this hour be a, a settling ground for us. And here may we take up and put on the armor of our warfare. When we go from here, may it be shoulder to shoulder, eyes forward, and attention. An alert for whatever darkness needs to be dispelled by light. For whatever ugliness needs to be displaced by beauty. Whatever wrong needs to be set right. Here's the assembly, may we get together and may we go being together. As of Joshua, the centurion could have let many obstacles strand, stand between him and Jesus. Pride, doubt, money, Language, distance, time, self-sufficiency, power, even race. The centurion didn't do that. 
We did not let those barriers block his approach to Jesus. We don't need to either. What then keeps us from Christ? The centurion needed to lay down his status, his wealth, his position, and make himself a servant to Jesus. Think of the huge cultural leap that centurion had to take to allow Jesus to be his authority. But Jesus wasn't a Roman. He's not a member of his public. Jesus was unfamiliar in his world. And yet this is the, the centurion entered Jesus' world at the urge of his friends, the Jewish elders, with blind faith in order to solve a problem. He knew no one else had the power to solve Joshua. Was, and, you know, to solve the problem. And Joshua was in the same boat. We in the church ought to have more to say about good soldiers when we talk of war and peace. We ought to recognize that Christ-like values which can be found everywhere in life, even in the armed forces. But then we must ask ourselves, what happens to them? What happens to these good soldiers? The answer is they were sent to fight in evil wars. This is the words for a minute written by a soldier looking back on his own experience of war. <clears throat> what kind of war do, do civilians think we fought anyway? We shot prisoners in cold blood, wiped out hospitals, killed or mistreated enemy civilians, finished off the enemy wounded, tossed the dying into a hole with the dead, boiled the flesh off enemy skulls to make table ornaments for sweethearts or carved their bones into letter ornaments. Not every American soldier, or even 1% of our troops committed unwarranted atro atrocities. That the same might be said of the enemy. But the war necessitated many so-called crimes. The bulk of the rest could be blamed on the mental distortion which war produced. The mental distortion which war produced. Do you think this is written by a Vietnam veteran? We've gotten a pretty bad rap. And this somehow, there was only one generation of soldiers to commit atrocities. The words I just read were written by a, a veteran of World War II, a veteran of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. He fought in what Americans may naively call the Good War. Even in our text from Joshua this morning, we see how wars were fought thousands of years ago. Israel plundered cities and burned them to the ground. The enemy soldiers ran for their lives. The Israelites tracked them down and slaughtered them. They killed every man, woman, and child they could find. The Bible says it did not leave any that free. General Sherman didn't say war's heck. He said war's hell. Amen. So it is. Souls of every age have known it. War brings hell to the land, the innocent civilians, the soldiers themselves. We Americans called World War II a good war because it didn't fight. It happened on our soil. But ask the Europeans and the Russians about it. Was it a good war over there? War is hell. War might be necessary on occasion, but don't call it good. War is always evil. That's all there is to it. Today there are Christians in our land who seem to want war. If not with Russia, Central America, or some other third world country or region, or China maybe. The enforcement of imperialism and nationalism collide. Or these holy war Christians frequently cite texts like this one from Joshua to justify themselves. The Bible is a violent book, they say. And God's a God of war. We are his soldiers and nation in the, in the battle against the godless hordes. The Lord will bless our fight with victory. Never mind 
How's those Christians ignore all that Jesus said? Never mind how they ignore all that the Old Testament says about evils of war, the blessings of peace. But they even missed the point here in, in Joshua. Remember that wherever the Old Testament seems to bless war, there's usually a little clue somewhere to make us stop and think and keep war in a more somber perspective. That's the same here in Joshua. And a clue is here, the chariots. When the battle's over, God tells the Israelites to burn the chariots that they captured from the enemy. Now, why in the world would they want to burn the chariots? At a time when wars were fought hand-to-hand -hand on the ground, the chariot was a kind of ultimate weapon. It's kind of like their nuclear bomb of their age. There's certainly a great leap forward in the technology of death. So why would the Israel burn these chariots and voluntarily give up an important advantage in the arms race of their day. Hmm. They did it to make sure they didn't use a new weapon. The Israelites of Joshua's day, war was fought under God, and God was a nation's security, not the latest weapon. The minute they trusted in themselves for their defense, they were doomed. This is precisely what happened later, during the age of the prophets. Most Americans find this unimaginable, but ancient Israel rejected the secular wisdom of, of peace through strength. They acted faithfully with a form of unilateral disarmament. Of course, chariots became crossbows. Crossbows became cannons. Cannons became machine guns. Machine guns became missiles. Today our chariots are called defense, or strategic defense, or Star Wars. But we admit it or not, we are just like every other nation on earth in this respect. We find our security in our weapons, not in God. We pay lip service to God, but look to ourselves for strength. And just like Israel, in the age of the prophets, our nation is not eager to hear what God's servants would faithfully say. Because you have trusted in your chariots and the multitude of your warriors, therefore the tumult of war shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be destroyed. Hosea 10 13. Our nation has it all wrong insofar as things military are concerned. We should be celebrating our soldiers and condemning war. Instead, we condemn our soldiers and praise and celebrate war. We often hear politicians and business leaders praising the courage of, and sacrificing our soldiers. The thing is, how can a nation praise veterans one day and cut their programs and ignore them the next day? <laughs> this is pretty cynical and callous. It's a national disgrace which makes patriotic speeches about veterans ring hollow. Meanwhile, the president of a flag company reports that sales American flags have gone through the roof lately, especially during the last several years. He's quoted as saying, our national self-esteem has improved, and it's good for business because people are buying better flags, more expensive flags. But during my time in the military, I served on post-funeral detail and I participated in numerous other military funerals as a pastor and minister for the last 50 years. In that period of time, not once, not once I ever see American flag go down with that deceased. Not once. In every instance, just like at my dad, the flag was removed, attended service, needed to be handed to us and survive. It's true, a nation cannot die for somebody. It's powerless to do so. Indeed, it must not die. A nation survives, and the removal of the flag and the casket symbolizes that. Though all its citizens die, the nation continues. It's impressive that the symbol of our faith 
is the cross of Jesus, who died for men and women of all nations, so that they may have life. A nation will finally say its farewell to us, but our Savior will not. Remember the centurion and all the good soldiers today. Remember how even in the most violent episodes, the Bible does not bless our vision of war. God's word requires <coughs> repentance and a national leap of faith because it says that righteousness must be our armor and God our defense, even in a dangerous world. The passage from Joshua ends with, when the long battle was finally over, the land had rest from war. Israel crushed her enemies with force, but there was no peace for Israel. Only a rest from war. Folks, that's what we have today. Right now. A rest from war. Period. Because our patriotic bluster and our lack of real faith in God keeps us blind to the paths of peace. May God have mercy on us, on the souls of all the good soldiers who have died in bad war. May he guide and watch over our service personnel wherever they are stationed around the world. And we give a loving and grateful, thankful, thank you for all those who serve, known and unknown, when called. And may he have mercy on the soul of our nation.